Okay, so to begin. So um, it is all about quick and dirty research methods for the virtual classroom today. Um, I am a teacher and I do research, uh, but I'm primarily a teacher and I work at the intensive English program at Tokyo Kase University, which is a women's university um, in the north of Tokyo. So um, I, as I said, I'm a teacher researcher, but primarily a teacher. Uh, my main areas of interest are phonology acquisition. Um, and I like straightforward methods for the classroom for the other aspects of my teaching. Um, and this will hopefully become clearer um, as we progress through this talk. Okay, um, so I'm going to be looking at motivations for using kind of naive methods in classrooms and virtual classrooms. Um, I'll look at some example problems, and this is not like problems you'll face, but more like the kind of problematizing of our classroom practices. And then the results that you can gain um, from uh, carrying out these kind of naive research methods. So, the motivations. Um, and there are a few of these actually. So, um, if we um, look at our classrooms, well, there's got to be some reason to research it. And one of the reasons that kind of uh, drove me to do this talk is that there's a lot of talk about people never been trained in pedagogy uh, on uh, in their PhD programs or in master's programs and things unless they're actually doing an education-based uh, degree. Um, but when we're teaching, there is always room for improvement. Um, it's pretty much the same as anything that we do, um, but um, we can't really do that unless we're examining <laughs> and reflecting on what we're doing. Um, so if we can look at our practice and make it more effective, it's going to be more satisfying, not just for our students, uh, but also for ourselves. Because if we're teaching, presumably we kind of volunteered for this kind of role. And therefore, if you want to do something, then surely you want to do it properly. So um, that's my motivation for this. Um, also, why research the virtual classroom? Well, it's mostly new for us. Um, nobody's really um, kind of accustomed to teaching online um, a lot, usually. Um, so um, if we conduct these kind of inquiries to us, um, to ourselves, then it will help us if, if or when we have to do it again. And I'm not thinking about another kind of massive global pandemic. I'm thinking about the mundane kind of things like snow days or, you know, if something happens and you can't actually get on site to teach, then presumably somebody can help set something up in a classroom for remote learning or something similar. Um, so can get around the inconveniences that keep us from face-to-face -face teaching. I'm noticing the, the chat boxes and yeah and some lovely comments there yeah. So why use naive methods? Well um, the main ones for most people are going to be time and money. Um, I am an unfunded um, master's candidate um, I've already got one master's degree. I'm doing another one for the library access. Um, so time and money um, are very difficult. Um, but openness is also one more reason um, to conduct uh, this kind of uh, naive uh, investigation. And it's easy to replicate. So we can kind of 
look at uh, kind of our methodology section when we're writing up reports if that's the kind of road we want to go down and anybody else should be able to replicate what we did in our classrooms or virtual classrooms um, as we explain the kind of problematizing that we went through. So I'm going to take a look at some example problems and the problematization. So um, when I talk about problems, I'm thinking about um, when you're thinking about what you want to improve in your classroom practice, um, then you're usually thinking about um, what you're going to do. Oh, SD, I'm also a GTP. I did a graduate teaching program uh, in uh, primary schools uh, in a former life. Um, anyway, problematizing. So we're looking at our classroom practice and we're thinking, well, this could be better. And then we normally think about how it could be better. And so um, one of the example problematizations that I uh, looked at uh, myself um, was the kinds of questions I ask in the classroom. So um, when we're looking at questions, there are, not all questions are equal. Okay, uh, they're also not the same. So um, I thought about tallying the question type um, that I asked. So I did this when I was teaching in junior high schools. Um, and I kept a simple tally of display questions and referential questions. A display question is simply a question that you already know the answer to. Um, so, for example, if I say, oh, what's the capital of England? That's a display question. OK, a referential uh, question uh, would be something like, um, which city do you think um, typifies England, in your opinion? So it's an opinion based question, so I don't already know the answer. So um, is there a balance there? Um, are you using too many display questions? Are you using too few referential questions? Um, this could have an effect. Um, so Cynthia Brock um, did research into the use of display questions and referential questions um, in uh, language teaching. And she found that there were effects on the syntactic complexity. Basically, when a lot of display questions were used, uh, the complexity of sentences went down. When more referential questions were used, students spoke with more complexity in their sentence structure or giving fuller answers. Now, because university is a kind of international enterprise nowadays, um, I can't imagine that there are many university classrooms um, where these kind of uh, questions aren't going to have some kind of effect. Um, and I've also, I don't know this for sure, but my intuition is that um, if you're using a lot of display questions, even with first language speakers, you're going to get very straightforward answers, whereas something that requires a little bit more mental engagement is going to get you um, more probing answers, I guess. And the tool you need, just a piece of paper, okay? If you might lose concentration, as I am wont to do, um, you can voice record yourself. Most of us have several devices uh, and, you know, even schools are usually OK about you recording yourself as long as you delete it when you're finished and the information doesn't get leaked outside of the institution. But, um, of course, check with admin uh, beforehand, check with your students. As I said, with my junior high school students, can I record the lesson? It's just for me to see if I can improve anything. And they were like, yeah, sure, go ahead. So that's fine. So 
time, as I say, is a, a very important uh, commodity in teaching. And uh, certainly it is for students too. So um, who do you spend your time with is an example of this. Um, which groups or individuals do you gravitate toward? And who do you avoid? Uh, who do you usually call on? And does it correlate to grades? Okay, uh, this is a big one. So if you're finding that you're spending a lot of time with the people who are getting the high grades, is it because you're going to them and giving them more teacher time that they're getting high grades? Or is it just a, another case of correlation doesn't uh, equal causation? Um, so you can find this out quite easily. So how we can do it is simply using video uh, with our virtual classroom. Um, it's easier to get the time that you've uh, spent with everybody. And if you're interested in going more granular with this, you can use Elan for more detailed analysis. It's a tool for corpus uh, linguistics uh, using uh, spoken language. However, um, it's got a bit of a learning curve, but it's not too difficult. Um, another way that you could do it is also if you're in a non-virtual classroom is just simply put a post-it note down each time you visit a student and then find out which student got the most post-it notes at the end of the classroom at, at the end of the class so you can't do it by amount of time but you can certainly do it by number of interactions and you know that's it's a simpler way I also uh, like to look at feedback. So what kind of feedback we give uh, is uh, pretty crucial in our classroom practices. Um, do we give unimodal feedback? Do we give multimodal feedback? That just means basically, are we giving uh, feedback in one modality? So that is, uh, are we giving mainly written feedback on a task? Um, are we giving uh, two modalities in our feedback? Um, and um, when we give multimodal feedback, we can give, like, say, for example, written or video or audio. And um, some of our students have preferences about the feedback they get. Actually, Nash and Winston and uh, Winston and her colleagues um, carried out research at, in Australian higher education and found that students preferred uh, multimodal feedback and that they were more likely to take responsibility um, for um, acting on the feedback. So we do want efficacy in our feedback because basically when we're teaching, we want our students to improve their performance. So if they're going to actually act upon our feedback, that's going to help facilitate this. So um, one way that we can uh, check uh, this kind of thing is just A, B, test it. So try one way of feedback, then another, which gives better results. And better results is in the eye of the beholder. What is your metric for this? Okay. Are uh, you looking for student preference? Are uh, you looking for um, more engagement with feedback and actually doing what has been advised. So um, an A-B test is quite simple. Um, I presume that most of us who teach are giving more than one assignment during a semester course. So it, as I say, it should be pretty straightforward. Uh, my students um, preferred um, video feedback on their essay writing and that's simple with screencast software such as uh, the game bar in uh, Windows. Um, if you're on a Mac you can use um, QuickTime and there are numerous screencast uh, software options available for Linux. Um, so now I'm going to take a look at the results that we can gain. Um, by looking at our classrooms. So um, the results that you can get are um, greater equity in the classroom. 
Um, so hopefully we all want to uh, treat our students um, maybe not the same, but we want to facilitate the same kinds of performances from them. And so uh, if we can spend um, suitable amounts of time with each student, then that's great. If we can uh, check that we're um, engaging with our students in a way that's going to best uh, bring about uh, learning and learning affordances, that's going to be great. Um, it also lets us monitor our own conscious biases, um, like who are we going to um, for questions and answers. So, you know, if we are, uh, do, well, Socratic method there, SD, yeah, it's a great idea, but one of my um, kind of misgivings with the Socratic method sometimes is that um, if if teachers take too much control over it, it can result in um, too much of uh, one person and not enough of everybody. Um, some people are going to be um, really, really quiet and not participate. Um, so participation is kind of one of the big things for me as a language teacher because uh, output helps to facilitate that. So also, if we can... Um, have the classroom as a place of participation. It means that we avoid kind of notions of the hidden curriculum, like the teacher is the boss. Then that's a great Socratic classroom. I do like um, teacher-centered, uh, uh, sorry, uh, learner-centered teaching. So um, it's great. So if we can make the learners uh, kind of an equal part of the classroom uh, and kind of um, if we can monitor how we facilitate this, then uh, hopefully we're going to have uh, the kind of classroom that everybody wants to be in. So we also avoid tying ourselves in knots because then, you know, if we, it's going to take less planning if we have evidence about what we're doing or what is the preferred outcome for the classroom uh, processes. So hopefully... Um, with just a couple of simple bits of paper, um, we can analyse what we're doing uh, a little bit more easily. So um, these are the references. As I say, the slides will be going up uh, pretty soon. Um, so, um, yeah. If you want to get in touch with me these are my contact details you can't see me bowing but i am bowing trust me okay um yeah um and of course i would love to hear your questions if you want to unmute your mic i don't mind doing it spoken i can do it in the text chat too Uh, well, I've never taught a class of a hundred before. Um, so the biggest, yeah, like a lecture kind of class. Yeah, I know the pressure is on with those kind of classes as well to kind of make them more participatory. But, you know, you've got a hundred students. Um, uh, this is kind of one of those big kind of problems of the modern neoliberal university, isn't it, really? Um, the I think the most you can do with that is kind of um, try and put together groups and um, have, you know, groups participating and then, you know, probably is going to be somebody who works as a group leader who's somebody who's less shy than others and will volunteer to share the group's findings at the end of um, a piece of group work like that and that I mean this is what I've had to do when I've had uh, ESOL classes of 50 students or so and it's monitoring um, like those groups rather than individuals um, and then week by week I can kind of try and check some of the individuals as I'm going around but like you say it's a bit of a nightmare um so in a physical classroom I've used the post-it notes thing the classroom does look a bit of a mess um 
but um, you know you just go around and pull up the post-it notes uh, quickly um, I usually uh, take a photograph after the students have left the classroom and uh, then um, a, or a photograph of each uh, column of desks and then then I just pick up all of the post-its and then there I can also use them again later if uh, if I need to but uh, it's, a, it's a it's a really tricky one I wish I had an answer uh, but I'd rather say no I don't have an answer than pretend <laughs> yeah sure This is something I'm still struggling with sometimes, and it totally depends upon the class makeup, um, to be honest. Um, a lot of students, certainly in my context, is uh, a lot of uh, monolingual classes actually now, um, entirely Japanese students, and a lot of students don't want to have cameras on. And I can understand that nobody wants to see an unmade bed. <laughs> and, you know, I wouldn't be making my bed very often if I didn't really have to leave the uh, the room and stuff. So uh, the, I think the best we can do is provide the affordances. Um, you know, I think as teachers, um, sometimes we try and take responsibility for things that actually aren't our responsibility. Um, so we have to, you know say to our students you know this is kind of what you've signed up to do you know that there's some kind of evaluation involved in the course so I can't evaluate silence um, if it's a spoken uh, task or assignment so um, but if we can make the work as meaningful as possible and that's usually some kind of simulation of a real world kind of task then uh, that should, should hopefully be a bit more engaging um, for students but again everybody has different agendas in a classroom um, and you know at the university level everybody is uh, an adult so they get to make adult decisions and sometimes that is not participating you know sometimes people have had a really crappy day as well so um, it totally depends uh, some students are really gregarious um, online and some just really don't like the kind of environment of shouting into the void when everyone has their cameras off um much the same as teachers so it totally depends is the the the, the short answer to my to your question cheers uh, multimodal feedback um that's been successful for me just to address uh rusty's question um uh, screencasting has been uh, really, really um, useful um, for my students, um, they said, because basically they sent me an essay and I just took a screencast as I looked at their essay, um, my first impressions of it. Um, so looking at things like document formatting, um, spacing issues, indents and so on, then also looking at... Uh, grammatical organization, vocabulary use, and even kind of like kind of use of things like the spell and grammar checker in Google Docs or Word. Um, and it's it's uh, been really useful because they can see it in real time. They see the cursor moving over it, whereas even a commented document, it's, it's a little bit harder to understand. Um, and the flow of information is a lot easier and more um, intuitive, I guess. Discord server for a cl uh, class. I would love this kind of thing. I've tried to do it in our LMS with uh, Moodle, just having a kind of water cooler chat forum. And yeah, it's not a place that students like because it's it's monitored. You know, um, there's a there was an article went around the internet. Um, by a guy who's a PhD student and basically no more cop shit in the classroom or so, something. Nobody wants to socialise where the teacher is, yeah? So, um, yeah, it's... If the students can set up the, the thing, uh, the forum where they're going to interact outside the classroom, then 
let that happen and don't be afraid to say hey like somebody set this up i won't be there so enjoy yourselves um, and it's it's going to be probably more likely to facilitate real communication uh, you just don't get to see what it happens uh, there and that's okay i like that i'm not here unless you at me yeah um, and I think that's healthy because as teachers, we are on call. You know, there's an expectation that we're always at the end of our email sometimes. But uh, I, I like to keep more or less uh, office hours if I can. It's uh, healthier. And I've got a family and I like to spend time with them. <laughs> so, yeah. Any more questions? then I would like to thank you all so much for your time. Um, so, and thanks for putting up with my technological ineptitude. Uh, so just once again, I will share my contact deets with you. And oh, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Um, so yeah, feel free to email me, um, DM me, and uh, the slides will go up on my website like pretty much imminently and I'll try and set up some kind of uh, video of this too. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.